Well, hey, everybody. I'm Sasha Mackler. I lead the energy program at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And good afternoon. Really want to just thank you all and welcome you all here today. We've really got a great lineup on a really important topic related to the energy transition that um, aligns really nicely with the moment that we're in right now. Uh, on the one hand, the political moment, we are uh, just sort of looking back on a remarkable period of legislative productivity when it comes to energy and climate. Of course, the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act really being the two centerpieces of what's happened over the last few years. And then we're currently in a dialogue right now, as I think we all appreciate, on energy permitting and um, waiting to see what might uh, be in store for us uh, there, which all kind of can fit together into a package of activities that can really help to accelerate the deployment of advanced energy technology. So that's that's one of the things that I want to kind of highlight today. The other is the environmental moment. This is Climate Week, uh, and uh, I think it really offers a moment of reflection for all of us as we look at kind of where we are right now um, with our environmental challenges and what kind of progress we're making broadly with respect to uh, reducing carbon emissions and dealing with the risks of climate change. So with that as the backdrop, um, just wanted to say that the Bipartisan Policy Center, you know, we're really intentionally focused on being a destination for conversations and policy work that are really focused on pragmatic solutions to these challenges. And our programming uh, this week really is emblematic of that agenda. I mean, today we have a great discussion lined up for you all on what's the future of carbon capture. Uh, later on this week, on Thursday, I'll just say that we're doing an event in this room uh, with the chairman of the CFTC on what's the future of carbon markets and what's the federal role um, in, in being involved in, carbon, in the voluntary carbon markets to ensure their credibility and their ability to scale with integrity over time. And so that's in the morning. And then in the afternoon on Thursday, we're doing an event on Capitol Hill uh, with Representative Joyce from Ohio and the head of the DOE loan program office, Jigger Shaw, really showcasing the investments that the public sector and the private sector are making in the clean energy economy and creating jobs all around the country in red states and in blue states uh, as we look ahead. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, these are great topics. These are important conversations. And they're really led and driven by the leading players and thinkers in this space from across the commercial world, the policy and, and political worlds. And um, you know, I, this, is, this is BPC. And we're really excited uh, for all of these conversations. And I want to thank everyone uh, in the audience today for joining us on this journey and also in these conversations that we're hosting. And I especially want to thank uh, our participants in the panel today for sharing their time and their perspectives as we unpack this issue uh, that's in store right now, what's the future of carbon capture? Uh, this is not a straightforward question, as I think we all appreciate. Carbon capture has been identified by many independent, incredible groups as sort of a, a key plank of the decarbonization pathway that we need to confront if we're going to address the risks of climate change. But uh, I think we all also appreciate it's no secret that carbon capture has really struggled to achieve commercial liftoff. And uh, in the wake of the progress we've seen with, 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 uh, with policy and in the, the activities that we're seeing in the, in the private sector right now, uh, I think today's conversation, we really want to unpack if we're at an inflection point right now with carbon capture and, is the, and what does the future hold? And we've got, I think, the right people to start to um, really dig into that question. Uh, we'll start things off today with a keynote from one of our favorite congressmen, uh, who's a real leader in energy and climate issues in the Republican Party, uh, Representative Garrett Graves. Um, and then we are privileged to have Dan Ammon here from Exxon Low Carbon Solutions. Uh, he'll be uh, participating in a fireside chat with me. And then we have a great panel of, of, um, that will follow that, that will be led by my colleagues and Dan Fishman. Uh, so why don't we move right into the, um, to the discussion with Congressman Graves. Unfortunately, uh, he's not able to join us in person. Uh, given his obligations up on Capitol Hill today, but we're really grateful he was able to take the time out of his schedule to join us virtually. Uh, and I'm confident we can make this work with the crack BPC tech team here. Uh, and we, I thank them for adapting quickly to this situation. Uh, I'll, I'll just say really quickly, Congressman Graves is in his fifth term in Congress, uh, and he is now in the Republican leadership as chair of the elected leadership committee. Um, he's 
he represents the sixth district of Louisiana, which has significant oil and gas uh, uh, projects going on in that area. So he knows the importance of carbon capture extremely well. Uh, as a member of the House Committee on Natural Resources, uh, and he was uh, formerly the ranking member of the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. So he understands many of the dimensions of the issues that we will be talking about here today. BPC, you know, really appreciates the work that Congressman Graves puts into all of the issues that he that he digs into, and um, really is a pragmatic voice on Capitol Hill. Uh, and uh, we thank him for joining us today. So Congressman Graves, with that, I'll turn it over to you. And I'll, I'll, I'll just say, sorry, uh, that following his remarks, we are gonna fold in some, some, uh, some uh, questions from the audience before we turn it over to the fireside chat. So we'll make sure to save some time for that. Thank you, Congressman. Great, thank you. And uh, you didn't clarify that you you meant easy questions from the audience. Um, but uh, hey, thanks for the opportunity to join you today. And, and before I dive in on, on carbon capture storage and challenges and opportunities, I wanted to talk a little bit about energy policy and where we are. Uh, we've watched over the last several years where there has been this really strong push to move us in a direction of lower emissions, of moving in a direction of renewable energy technologies. And I think what's most important is that we look at some of the progress or metrics over the last few years. And so as we've watched, and I think there are three kind of important criteria that we apply in looking back at energy policy and accomplishments. Um, one of them is affordability of energy. Uh, one of them is energy security. And the third one is emissions. And, and so, look, it doesn't matter where you are ideologically. And I'm not just saying this because we're with the BPC. I'm saying it because this is what's best for America. We've watched as energy prices, gasoline and, and utility prices have spiked 40% or more. We've watched as, as nearly 40% of America has had to choose among food, medicine, and groceries um, or their utility bills or energy costs. They, these are false choices. So I think it's fair to say on affordability, we're failing. Number two, on energy security, looking at, at, at America being able to supply its own energy. We've, we've gone and we've become increasingly dependent upon foreign energy sources, whether it's solar panels, whether it's lithium ion battery storage technology, or, um, or, it's, or it's oil and gas, we've watched as we become increasingly dependent. And I think if you look in the out years, it's gonna get even worse. And then the last one is emissions. And many of you may be surprised to hear this, but emissions have actually gone up over the past few years. They went up about 5.2, 5.5% um, between 2020 and 2021. They went up about another 1.3% between 2021 and uh, 2022. And so, so let me go back through. The, the prices have gone up, so affordability, we've got challenges, we've got challenges in energy security, and we certainly have challenges on emissions. What you've seen driving a lot of the energy policy has been putting hydrocarbons, putting oil and gas on the bullseye, that, that we're gonna get rid of these energy sources. And I think that, that what we've gotta do moving forward is instead of staying focused on energy sources, We've got to stay focused on emissions and carbon capture and storage is a key part of that strategy. Let me explain a little bit more. The Department of Energy's Energy Information Administration came out and, and released an energy projection. They call it an outlook and they do it every year. Their latest outlook that was issued just a month, maybe a month and a half ago, found that, that the global demand for hydrocarbons for oil and gas is gonna go up 50% over the next 27 or so years, 50%. There are also various studies that show that some of the cleanest barrels of natural gas, excuse me, cleanest barrels of oil and some of the cleanest cubic feet of natural gas are actually American energy products and particularly that coming out of the Gulf of Mexico. So, so let's just align those two. If you're gonna have an increase in global demand for energy, including oil and gas, you're gonna have, um, uh, the, 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 the energy sources in that category of oil and gas that have the lowest carbon intensity, let's connect those dots and let's produce energy there. And then let's complement it with carbon capture storage. So the real question that I'm supposed to be answering here is, uh, 
is, is the sort of the, the challenges and opportunities associated with CCS. And so, look, opportunities back in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2017, we implemented something called 45Q, section of the tax code that puts an incentive on carbon capture and storage. It provides a tax incentive. That has been improved or enhanced since, including most recently in the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was done last year. Uh, it enhances or grows the, the tax incentive associated with carbon capture and storage, including direct air capture. Um, and so, so, so certainly I think the economics are there to, to do carbon capture and storage. The next is the regulatory component. Just to give you an idea and, and something we've worked with the BPC on for a number of years is regulatory reform. Uh, the average road project today takes about seven years, seven years to go uh, through the, the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA process, the environmental review process. Seven years, okay, yeah, that's a road project. You have all sorts of other categories of projects, but it gives you some idea of how long this takes. To put that in comparison, when President Jimmy Carter was president, uh, Jimmy Carter had guidance out of his uh, White House that said that that process should take one year for an environmental impact statement, the most thorough review, one year. So, so we are out there in this regulatory, uh, just red tape, or more ass that is 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 really delaying projects, and it's not just delaying projects like a oil pipeline or a gas pipeline or a road project. It is delaying the deployment of solar panels. It's delaying the deployment of wind projects. It's delaying the the the, the projects that are transporting or conveying carbon to be sequestered. It is delaying the carbon sequestration projects. So 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 the tax incentives I think are in a in a spot that makes this economic. Um, the, the regulatory process is incredibly challenged, and I think the energy policy uh, realm that we're operating in right now that is basically saying we cannot produce any more oil and gas, we've got to stop using it, is a flawed strategy that needs to be recalibrated or corrected to where we're focused instead on emissions. Um, in the United States, we have uh, some of the best opportunities, particularly in I'm very proud in Louisiana and in Texas, some of the best geographic and geologic conditions to do carbon capture and storage. We're trying to encourage this administration to approve um, the delegation of authority. There's a uh, called Class Six. It's basically where the the states, the respective states, that in Louisiana, the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources would be in charge of basically approving these projects rather than than going through the laborious EPA, EPA process on approval. So um, that's something that, that that absolutely needs to move forward. Um, but um, uh, and I think that that's a that that is going to help to expedite approval of these projects. Now, the last thing I want to bring up that's really important, and as a matter of fact, I just met with the CEO of Air Products a little while ago. Um, we have a number of projects in Louisiana that have been proposed for CCS. Uh, two of the first larger ones out of the gates were met with extraordinary opposition from both the far left environmental crowd and the far right. It was a fascinating uniting of efforts. And um, watching this happen and looking at it, the rumor mill just absolutely took off when these projects were proposed. There was not information that was available. There were not experts that were there. Um, these projects were not properly communicated or marketed to the public. And so we now have a state that is one of the top producing states for oil and gas, one of the largest chemical industries in the nation that largely has public sentiment opposed to these projects um, with concern that it's going to threaten the environment. So I do want to make note that the fourth thing and, and one of the most important is ensuring that we're getting accurate, scientifically based information, that we're answering the questions of the public about this. Many people view this as a, um, as a new technology, as something that could be scary. I don't view it that way at all, um, but, but we have got to answer questions and ensure that the way that these projects are being carried out does protect our communities, does protect our environment, and, and has proven one thing, and I apologize, I, 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 my last thing I promise uh, here before we bounce to Q&A, um, one other opportunity in the policy space that I meant to cover that I think is really important. 
Right now, carbon capture and storage, the 45Q incentives that are in the tax code, they are focused on anthropogenic sources or man-made sources of, of, of CO2 that are often byproducts or um, as a result of, of, of industrial activities, um, in addition to direct air capture. I think that we're missing an opportunity uh, to also incentivize biogenic or natural solutions. For example, uh, planting trees. Um, we are sitting here watching as we're coming out and we're gonna be spending in some cases $100,000 a ton to sequester emissions with some of these newer technologies that folks are looking at. Meanwhile, uh, or, or to sequester or to reduce emissions. Meanwhile, I can go plant a tree in America or in a third world country and probably sequester emissions for somewhere around three to $6 a ton. Um, so, so we cannot ignore this huge opportunity that exists that is compatible with our natural environment. Um, and I think is, is really, really important in, um, in, 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 in being an additional tool that we can use. Some of you may have heard Speaker McCarthy and others, uh, but Re Republican and Democrat support for ideas like Trillion Trees um, that, that, that would help to sequester massive amounts of, of greenhouse gases and help to advance our bipartisan objectives of more affordable, of more secure, and um, and cleaner energy sources. So, with that, I'd love to flip it over to y'all and take the easy questions that I know that you're gonna you're gonna throw out. And there's a lot I think that we can unpack there in what you just uh, talked through. Um, so, what I would like to do is invite those of you that are online to, if you have any questions, you can submit them in the in 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 the chat function. Um, as on, on the YouTube channel, and then we can also open up here uh, to folks in the audience to ask questions. Please wait for the microphone uh, if you do have a question, because that's how the congressman will hear you and will be able to respond. And maybe while you're formulating your questions, I can take the moderator's prerogative and ask the first one um, to get things rolling. This is an easy one, I hope. Uh, so, so you you were involved with the with with you know the the the. the Republican leadership's uh, six pillars on climate that were released last year. And I know permitting reform, as you mentioned, was, was one of those pillars. I was wondering if you could just share a little bit around your thoughts on the path forward for permitting reform uh, and what's the sort of bipartisan opportunity that you see maybe coming together this, this, this Congress. Sure, yeah, uh, good question, and that, that's a softball, thanks. Uh, so um, permitting reform, uh, we, we did a, a bill called the, the Builder Act, and, and again, I know in the past PPP, PPC has supported it, and I wanna thank you for working with us on, on, on that important legislation. Um, you know, look, and, and I think the BPC recognized that it doesn't matter, as I mentioned earlier, if you're uh, a, a Democrat environmentalist that is out there seeking to deploy um, uh, wind and solar projects, or if you are uh, somebody who wants to build a road, this is a, a, a reform that is very much needed. Um, and, and so that bill was included in HR1, an energy package that passed the House uh, weeks ago. Uh, I think the path forward is that we have been talking to Republican and Democrat senators, um, Republican and Democrat House members about a path forward on what in HR1 would potentially be something that they'd be willing to take up. I personally believe that there are things beyond just the, the, the regulatory reform components um, that, that, that could be advanced. There are geothermal provisions in there, there are things on critical minerals and other things that I, I, I think sh really should transcend uh, party. So, so there's talk about taking HR1 and maybe uh, repackaging with a smaller uh, group of bills or, or, or package of bills. There's talk about uh, trying to throw permitting reform into the mix on, on debt ceiling negotiations that were neck deep in, at least, at least um, within the House uh, in right now. And so I think that there are a number of path forwards, but one of the things that I'm most excited about is that it does appear to enjoy broad bipartisan support. What the bill would do is it would limit an environmental assessment to one year, a uh, environmental impact statement to two years. Um, it puts some uh, sort of litigation reform and that and folks are welcome to sue if they want, but you first have to try and reconcile your concern through the public participation process. Um, so just a number of things after going through about 200 different NEPAs in my life, 
um, really reflects the, the 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 experiences and the therapy that I've had since. <laughs> You know, putting in on 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 this issue. Uh, I'd like to open it up for the audience. If there are any questions, please please jump in. We have a few minutes with the congressman. Hi, I don't actually know where the camera is. I don't. Um, I'm a Siri Hadrian. I'm a reporter with S and P Global. Um, I wanted to ask about you're talking about nature based carbon removal. Would you support uh, like a 45 Q like credit for say planting trees? And how would you, if so, how would you ensure that the the carbon is actually removed? Yeah. Hey, thank you uh, very much. Um, I appreciate the question. So, so one thing, like, let's let's be realistic. The the cost associated with planting a tree is significantly lower than doing some type of mechanical capture and sequestration um, associated with a with a traditional CCS project. So, I think that that just like with with uh, uh, traditional forty five Q from anthropogenic sources. Uh, the IRS is writing rules that 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 uh, you know sort of certifies the the mechanism that's being used to help to verify the the, the credit that would be given. Um, that's being perfected right now or finalized right now. So I think that that what you would do, and you could go back and look at things that have been done in the past. They used to do things called CDMs, clean development mechanisms. That was basically a certification process for the approach that you were using. So you could do things like, for example, we do under wetlands mitigation right now, where you say um, in this type of environment with this type of species, um, you are granted this many credits over this period of time. And so, um, you know, you come in and say, okay, if you plant, you know, this many trees and this habitat with this type of climate, um, then we're gonna give you this many credits over the next 20, 30, 40 years. And so um, I think that there is already very mature science on those metrics, but you would just have to uh, do the biogenic, uh, you would have to modify law, provide the biogenic incentive, and then, um, and then go through your rulemaking process. But I'm confident that the, that the science or the uh, sort of integrity um, of, the, of the credits is, is really mature at this point. And I think that, that the challenge would be more so getting the law changed than the rule written. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, Mike. And if I could ask you, if you stand up, then the camera can catch you so the congressman can see uh, where the question is coming from. Uh, Mike Moore, USCA. And uh, Congressman, quick question. When will Louisiana get its primacy for its class six? <laughs> <laughs> so, so as you know, uh, look, as you know, this is something that has been uh, been going on for way too long. Um, we had a number of conversations with Region 6, um, and finally were able to help dislodge uh, the application from Region 6 up to headquarters. We've spoken with headquarters a good bit as well, and um, here, here's my, my estimate right now. I think that they end up releasing it probably sometime uh, in May or June. I think that it ends up going through the full process and we're probably looking at final approval sometime in December or January. Um, so that's my that's my guesstimate. I, I think you have two states right now that have privacy on, on class six. Um, so we're not um, doing anything new or novel. They have other states that are already, already there. Um, it's been very frustrating about how long this has taken. And I also want to make note that something that's really important to me, as I'm sure it is you, is ensuring that, that if we go to a delegation authority or a primacy here, um, that, that the entity that is then uh, primary, that, that they have superior expertise. And I think if you look at the, at the um, capacity of the state of Louisiana, they have substantially more expertise and capacity than the EPA does at this point. So I think that the public would be better served and that you'd get better scientific integrity, more capacity, and uh, hopefully help to address this, this information gap that we've seen in Louisiana projects so far. Thanks, Congressman. Yeah, we have, we'll take one more from the floor and then I have one from online and then we'll have to wrap this up. Hey, Congressman, thanks for your remarks. Um, Sean Todd, Fox Potomac Resources. Quick question about nuclear power. Uh, not sure, I, I came in a little late, not sure. I heard you talk about the role of civilian commercial nuclear power, but do you think that has a role, role to play? I'm sure you do, but what type of role? How can we move it forward and specifically in the Congress? Thank you. 
Yeah, so I actually didn't talk about nuclear, but I appreciate that. I appreciate the prompting. So, you know, I talked earlier about how I think we've got to stop putting a bullseye on energy sources and instead try and stay focused on emission reduction strategies while keeping in mind things like affordability and, um, and, and energy security. And in fact, with the task force that, that we worked on that, that was mentioned earlier, we really looked at things like reliability, affordability, cleanliness. We looked, about, we looked at exportability of the technologies and we looked at security of the supply chain, kind of those five things guiding us. And so I think that for nuclear, you look at things like Diablo Canyon in California, where they were shutting down the nuclear power plant only to then send a letter from their their cardboard or whatever saying that they wanted to increase emissions because they were going to backfill it with uh, with natural gas or coal or some other type of, of energy source. And you're like, wait a minute, what is going on here? You're shutting down nuclear emissions-free power and replacing it with, with um, uh, sources that had greater emissions. And so here we have the state of California attempting to be a global leader in energy and, and climate change issues, yet that they're moving in the wrong direction. Um, Germany is another perfect example, seven, nine, whatever it is, nuclear power plants, they're shutting down once again, uh, backfilling that with, with other sources. And we've even watched right here in the United States that we saw last year, I believe it was a nearly 15% increase in coal utilization as a result of, of not properly preparing for, for, um, uh, for the electricity demand. So how does that play into nuclear? Again, 19% of electricity in the United States today comes from nuclear power. It is all emissions free. Those projects, as you know, those power plants, they have a, a licensing life cycle. So that's gonna have an expiration. What are we gonna do? Are we gonna relicense? Are we gonna update the technology? Um, and I think there are two primary things that need to happen. Next Gen Nuclear is one for some of the larger footprints, the larger facilities. We've got to continue making progress on that technology and on the licensing process. I think that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission process is way too slow. It's, it's set up for 1970s era type technology. Some of the newer technologies are safer. We should be able to move faster. And secondly, and very importantly, is SMR, small modular reactors, really exciting about the potential of that technology. We've got some amazing innovators in the United States that are moving forward. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has pre-approved a design for a, an SMR reactor. Um, and the, the, the first of all, you, you, you actually have an opportunity to recycle some of the spent fuel rods. So you're addressing a waste issue, much, much lower risk. And so again, NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, should have an expedited or streamlined approval process and the ability to come plot these things in very quickly with modular construction uh, gives you the ability to power entire cities um, uh, in, in a very short time with a new emissions-free source. Uh, lastly, you're looking at France, you're looking at Russia, you're looking at China, all trying to advance new nuclear technologies. This is an area where the United States has historically led, and I think that we've got to continue leading the world with the technology, both on, on industrial scale as well as on the SMRs. Well, thanks, Congressman. I, I know I promised one question from online, but I think uh, in the interest of time, we're going to have to end it there. I want to respect your time and the, and the time of the rest of the program. Uh, so I um, want to just th thank you again for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate all the work you're doing up on the hill, and we wish you the best. Uh, hey, in, thank in you. Good seeing you. Take care. Thank you. Uh, and now I'd like to invite uh, Dan Ammon to come on up and join me here uh, on the podium, and we'll kick off the next part of our program. Mm -hmm. um, Dan is the president of Exxon's uh, Low Carbon Solutions business, a position he's held for about a year, uh, where, and where he leads the whole, all the efforts within the company to build a scalable business around decarbonized energy, which of course includes carbon capture. Uh, and I have to say he's had a really interesting career that I want to talk through with him, uh, where he has come from being uh, executive in the automotive and the finance sectors. Um, and I'll, I'll just say that Dan spent about a decade on the leadership team at GM, where he was CFO and then president. Uh, before taking the helm of Cruise, its autonomous vehicle company, in 2018 as its CEO. And before that, Dan spent about a decade as an investment banker, mainly as a managing director with Morgan Stanley. Um, and through the Low Carbon Solutions business, Dan and his team are focused on making the path to net zero economically viable and executable at scale, uh, with several, I think, really interesting um, announced projects underway, and it sounds like there's a whole lot more in the pipeline, which we're going to talk about. But Dan, welcome to the BPC. Great. It's uh, great to be here. 
thrilled, thrilled to have you here. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover in the next sort of 25, 30 minutes. Um, and the way I thought we could approach this discussion was maybe starting a little bit with your personal story and how you found your way to, to uh, low carbon solutions at Exxon. Um, and then make, maybe transition into what's Exxon doing in low carbon solutions and how you see the opportunity before maybe f finishing with some broader reflections on where, where is the industry and where is the sector headed. Sure. Uh, so with that in mind, um, you know, really interested to hear what's going on within, with, with, within the firm. Uh, let's start with kind of how you found your way to Exxon. How, how did a finance guy turn out to, 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 to go to the automotive and then, and then into, into the oil industry? Well, it goes back a step further than that. I actually grew up on a dairy farm in New Zealand, so that was the beginning. I um, uh, moved to the United States uh, when I was about 25 years old in the uh, late 90s, mid-late mid 90s. Uh, got a job on Wall Street through sort of a series of uh, sort of random events. Uh, and what I uh, did on Wall Street for Morgan Stanley primarily uh, was I worked a lot on big complicated transactions, big restructurings, corporate breakups, big mergers. And I've always been drawn to the, the off the run problem or the big complicated problem. And that's a thread that's gone through uh, everything that I've done uh, since then. And uh, as the financial crisis unfolded in 2008 and 2009, uh, I got involved in the restructuring of the automotive industry that went on uh, during that time and was the main financial advisor to General Motors as it went through its uh, restructuring and, and reorganization. And so at that moment had an interesting front row seat to the intersection of business and politics and labor and financial distress and sort of a big multivariable equation that yeah. needed to be solved to try to, to, uh, you know, to help uh, the automotive industry you know, through that. Uh, through that very challenging time. And so uh, on the back side of that, uh, my phone rang one day and it was General Motors on the other end of the line and they asked would I like to come and, and help uh, uh, with the next phase of the journey. And so being drawn to these big intractable challenging situations, I couldn't resist and so I left my nice comfortable uh, role on Wall Street and, and joined GM uh, at that stage. And we spent the next few years uh, you know, getting the company back into fighting shape and building great product and making money again. Um, but at that stage, it became clear that the next wave of fundamental change was coming to the automotive industry in the form of electrification of the car, self-driving technology, uh, and so on. And I became convinced of, of, of the view that, that these were not just you know, things that were going to come and go, but these were fundamental uh, trends that you know, for good reason would unfold. Uh, and self-driving in particular, I felt, was the thing that if, if there was one thing that was going to change how the automotive industry worked, then, then that was that. Uh, and so, long story short, GM ended up making, acquiring a small startup called Cruise, which was about 35 people at that time, uh, as a, a way into uh, building self-driving technology. Uh, and consistent with my theme of sort of moving to the next big challenge, I left GM I was president of GM, left and joined Cruise as CEO uh, uh, to advance that you know, through the next uh, stage of development to the point uh, where we, at the end of 2021, you know, sent a self-driving car out on its own out onto the streets of San Francisco. That, so, yeah. um, and so, you know, having made progress through that, uh, the question then was what was the next big challenge? And uh, I... Uh, had outreach and a connection uh, into ExxonMobil and began a dialogue there with, with Darren Woods about you know, low carbon solutions and this business that, that he wanted to put together and a corporation wanted to put together. And the genesis for that was um, that ExxonMobil had been working through its own net zero plans and figuring out how, do you, how does ExxonMobil take its own operations from where they are you know, towards net zero. And as they worked through that exercise, you know, came to the point of view that there was a lot of inherent capabilities inside of ExxonMobil that not only could be used to decarbonize ExxonMobil's operations, but also to, uh, to help third-party companies decarbonize, uh, decarbonize theirs. And so one of the things that, that was missed, uh, that's missed a little bit, I think, in the general sort of public discourse here is that if you look at the source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally, energy-related energy greenhouse gas emissions, it's about 35 billion tons a year, uh, metric tons a year, give or take. Of that, about 80% comes from 
a combination of heavy industry power generation and commercial transportation. And if going back to the automotive industry, light vehicle transportation accounts for somewhere in the 11 or 12 percent know, range. And, and so it's really important that the automotive industry decarbonizes, but it's you know, multiple times more important uh, that we figure out how to decarbonize you know, a lot of these you know, heavy industry uh, processes. And so that's where the capabilities of, of ExxonMobil really come in, uh, and that's what we're focused on. And we've got, as you mentioned, a lot of projects uh, you know, underway and up and running that I'm sure we'll talk about here in a minute. So the, the thread that runs through all of that is, you know, uh, I've always been drawn to these really huge challenges. And if you were to make a list of the most existential challenges facing humankind right now, I think most people would put the energy transition and climate change at the top of that list. Uh, and if you were to make a list, in my mind, of the, of the corporations that have the ability to actually help bend the curve uh, on the world's path to net zero, then I think ExxonMobil is at the top of that list, and that's why I'm here. That's why you're there. No, that, that's that's a great backdrop. Thank you for that. And that's it's a great segue in, into where I, I, I think we should go next, which is in energy circles, um, you know, your, your company is really seen as the iconic company. Um, you know, sophisticated, really deep engineering expertise, and it has a reputation for building projects that are delivered at scale and on time. And in policy circles, uh, you know, when, when we think about, um, you know, the role that Exxon plays in energy policy, it's really focused on the energy side of, of the policy equation, less on the climate side. And so uh, it turned some heads, I think, a year or so more ago when you announced the formation of the low carbon solutions business. Um, and I just wonder if you could, as we, as we sort of start to th hear a little bit more about the business model, how did that come to be? Uh, and and uh, what do you see as sort of the, the near-term business opportunity for the, for the solutions business? Well, we're trying to do two things at once. We're trying to help accelerate the world's path to net zero, and we're trying to build a compelling new business for the corporation. And those two things, from, from our point of view, go hand in hand. And the fundamental principle underlying that is that the energy transition won't happen if it can't be made to be economically viable. Right. If we can't bring the cost of abatement down, if we can't create uh, the right your policy in the first place and then have the market step in over time you know, to pick this up, then we're not going to solve this, you know, this enormous challenge. And so we've been very focused on, it was interesting to me coming into this, into the energy transition space. I, my perception from the outside was that there was this tremendous amount of activity going on and there was all of these announcements and press releases and MOUs and partnerships and things and I was like, man, we're going to have to like really get going here because there's a lot up. happening, a lot, a lot to catch up. The fact of the matter is like very little has happened in the, in the sense of real definitive agreements for real projects and, and real steel on the ground. And so one of the things that we've been very focused on from, you know, from the, the minute I got here was to, we had the sense that it's very important that we demonstrate that there are projects that work with today's technology, today's policy, today's infrastructure, and that we need to get those projects implemented and up and running. And that that in and of itself will have, you know, help create a positive flywheel effect. And I think, you know, when, to your point, when ExxonMobil says we're going to do something, there's a presumption and it's a correct presumption that a lot of thought and work has gone into, you know, coming to a point of view that this can work and should work and will be executed. And so that's why we've stepped in and said, you know, we need to lead the way with demonstrating that these projects you know, really can work. You know, it's interesting that the project that we announced was CF Industries uh, last October uh, to capture 2 million tons a year of CO2 emissions out of their uh, Donaldsonville, Louisiana facility. It's a fertilizer plant. Fertilizer plant, ammonia production plant for fertilizer. Um, that as far as we can tell, that is the first very large scale third party definitive CO2 offtake agreement that's ever been done. And so to think about sort of, you know, here we are talking about CCS and what's the future, and in some ways it hasn't even really started yet in that sense. Like there's been a lot, you know, we have done ExxonMobil, you know, captured a lot of CO2 over the years in our own operations and have experience in doing that. But when you step back and look at, you know, where is this, and you said this in your opening comments, where is this really working today? You know, it's, it's still early stages, and that's why we feel it is the right time to step in and, and sign up and contract these projects you know, with third-party customers, get them into execution, show that they work, 
show that you can earn a return uh, doing these projects. Uh, and we think that that demonstration step here is, is really important. Yeah, no, it's 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 really interesting way to sort of think about the business. And we, we, we have a similar view at the BPC when we think about policy, that the best way to kind of continue the policy momentum uh, that we've made so far is to show that the policies that have been implemented are successful and they work, and that's how you build the momentum for the next set of policies, because we know we're not done. And we'll talk a little bit about that going forward. So the commercial kind of uh, parallel you just described, sort of get the initial practice out there, get them moving, build that flywheel. I, I, you know, I think that's really how we have to think about on all of these issues as, 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 as we look ahead and build, build momentum. You know, and I'd, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. I mean, you've obviously, uh, you, know, you and your team, obviously been extremely busy from the Houston hub concept from a few years ago to now these, uh, the projects that you're starting to announce now. I mean, you just mentioned CF. Can you say a little bit about uh, the other project with Lindy and kind of what they have in common or, and then maybe how they're different? Yeah, so the second uh, major uh, CCS project we announced uh, just a couple weeks ago uh, is with Lindy, one of the large industrial gas companies that's uh, in Beaumont in Texas. Uh, and that is a, uh, a new build uh, blue hydrogen plant that they're building uh, for a customer of theirs. Uh, and we'll be uh, off taking 2.2 million tons a year of CO2 uh, out of that facility and similarly uh, transporting that and, uh, and storing that geologically. And so you know, that's the, the second, in many ways, very similar uh, construct to the CF Industries project. And what we've found is that by going out and leading the way with these first two landmark projects now, that that in and of itself is in, engendering more interest from other companies that, you know, might have been looking at something and saying, well, can this work now? You know, we're, we're, we're seeing interest from uh, sectors that people have said, you know, may not work yet. So we're, we're engaged, for example, with um, some combined cycle gas turbine operators, and we're starting to see the funnel of, uh, of different industries and different applications you know, start to open up, and we're pretty encouraged by, by the progress we're seeing there. Yeah, and I'll, I, maybe on that front, I, I did take note that you have this commercial arrangement with MHI, and is that something you're also working on sort of post-combustion capture as an offering to third parties? Yeah, that's a good example. One of the things that we've, we're, we're trying to do at the same time is get these initial projects going. So we've We've got this point of view, we need to get, get the initial projects up and running, and they, those are the things, as I said, they work with today's technology, today's policy, today's infrastructure. But that's a pretty small subset of what needs to happen. Right. And on the US Gulf Coast, you, you know, have a lot of things nearby that you need to do these projects. You've got emissions right there, you've got emissions storage nearby, uh, you've got natural gas feedstock for blue hydrogen production. You've got, a, you know, it, and it's, none of these projects are easy, but if you're going to pick a place to do one of these, that's about a, you know, the best place to, to start. At the same time, we need to be planning ahead for how do we open up the funnel of projects to do, you know, um, sort of 10x that and then 10x again and then probably 10x again after that, you know, to, to get the whole world on a, on a path to net zero. And if we look at the, the things that are going to be necessary to go down that road, it's really sort of on two fronts. One is we're going to need, you know, the effectively the price of carbon to continue to evolve. And so today, you know, in the United States, we've got IRA as sort of a proxy, you know, for, for putting a price on, on carbon. You know, that will need to continue to evolve and whether that's continued some, you know, policy, a combination of policy and market activity and eventually going over to, to primarily market activity, we're gonna need to see that, that price of carbon continue to evolve from here. At the same time, so, you know, and to increase over time, we expect. At the same time, we need the cost of abatement to come down. And in order to get the cost of abatement down, we need to do really two things. One is uh, to make some significant technology investments today that will start to pay off you know, in the coming years down the road that will bring down the cost of abatement. And then secondly, to start to scale up some of these initial projects, you know, you build exist, you know, initial infrastructure for something, you know, by definition, the more volume you put across that infrastructure, the marginal cost of that you know, comes down. And so therefore the big picture thing we're aiming at is, you know, cost, cost of carbon, price of carbon continues to evolve over time. On the one hand, cost of abatement, we work that down. On the other hand, that's what will open up the funnel of opportunities and the ability to decarbonize, you know, huge chunks of these markets that we're, that we're looking at. And so to that end, you know, what we're doing from a technology development point of view, there's a number of programs that we're working on 
inside the corporation that we're leading. Uh, direct air capture is a major area that we're, that we're focused on, for example. Um, but there are certain other areas where, where other partners have good existing technology that we can bring in. And so the example that you referenced is Mitsubishi Heavy Industries uh, is a leader in existing amine capture technology. We've partnered with them to, to attach that to our uh, sort of end-to-end -end CCS offering. And at the same time, we've also partnered with them from a technology point of view to, to lower the cost of that technology, bringing in some know-how that we have from our own research, uh, you know, bringing in their existing capability to drive that cost of abatement down through amine capture, which should again open up the funnel of, of projects that, that can work. And so it's the here and now of these initial projects to demonstrate this works, but also laying the, the foundation for reducing that cost of abatement over time through technology. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Really, really interesting. And then maybe um, to build on what you were just talking about, you know, this is sort of the, the various opportunities and how they might kind of grow over time. How do you see them sequencing in your, in your view? I mean, uh, and w what's your view on sort of, you know, how, how the revenue or the commercial opportunities look across, you know, the industrial capture uh, on ammonia versus maybe hydrogen or clean fuels or power? Are you prioritizing some things now and sort of saying, okay, we're going to have to look to that one later when something else happens, either from a cost perspective or from a policy perspective? Yeah, so we're... Um we're focused today, prim initially, I wouldn't say primarily, initially we're focused on um, CCS, hydrogen, uh, and biofuels, because those are the things, if you think about the, the capabilities of, of ExxonMobil and the solutions that are required, we sort of think about the solutions that are required you know, to accelerate the path to net zero in two buckets. There's electrons-based solutions mm -hmm. and there's molecules-based solutions. And, we fairly naturally, you know, sort of orient ourselves more to the molecules side of the equation because that's just the inherent capability that we have. You know, a lot of our projects involve renewable power and so on, and so it's not at the exclusion of that, but it's just in terms of where our, where our deep, deepest capabilities and, and skill set and therefore greatest source of advantage uh, resides. And so we're, that's, that's what brings us to focus on, on those categories. In addition to the two CCS projects that we announced. We have also announced uh, that we're advancing uh, work on what will be the world's largest uh, low carbon hydrogen production facility uh, at Baytown in Texas. It's, it'll be attached to uh, the very large existing uh, ExxonMobil Baytown complex. Uh, and we're, we're targeting that for a startup in 2027, 28 timeframe. The CCS projects we talked about are 2025, 26 startup. So to give you a sense for mm -hmm. the, the uh, uh, the cadence there, but we see we see hydrogen playing a huge role, particularly in the decarbonization of these industrial processes, both fuel switching out natural gas, uh, replacing that with hydrogen, uh, and then also uh, for a number of processes, backing out existing gray hydrogen supply and 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 replacing that with uh, with low low carbon hydrogen coming in. So we're, you know, what we're one of the challenges you have in building a new business is you know trying to do everything at once versus picking the handful of things that you truly have advantage in, focusing on those, getting these new projects up and running, but at the same time having a, a broad enough portfolio of capabilities that you can bring the right answer to the, to the, to the situation. Um, sometimes it will make more sense to fuel switch than it will to do post-combustion capture. Sometimes it will be the other way around. And you know that'll be very situation specific to what's going on on that side. As I alluded to earlier, not surprisingly, we're starting, you know, with the least challenging projects in a way, which are the very high concentration CO2 streams, you know, like the CF Industries and the, and the Lindy one are both good examples of that, uh, you know, similar to, uh, you know, the CO2 stream that will come out of our hydrogen production facility as well. And then we start to open up the funnel to some of the lower concentration, concentration streams, uh, ultimately working our, all, our way all the way down to direct air capture over time. Right, right. No, that makes sense, and and I, you know, that's a great segue in, in, into kind of um, maybe how how the policy progress that we made over the last few years, maybe, and what we might see coming forward could shape where this whole business goes. And so, I'd love your thoughts on, you know, what sort of impact either the infrastructure bill, which, as you know, has the sort of really the focus there when it comes to carbon capture, is really you know, funding programs for things like the hubs, either the hydrogen hubs or the DAC hubs or demonstration projects generally, 
or, or the Inflation Reduction Act, which has the tax credits 45Q or 45V, um, has that, I mean, I, I'm a, I, I, it sounds like it's really had, a, had an impact on your thinking. Um, would love to get a little bit more of a sense from you is, you know, has that really been the catalyst for some of these projects or, um, you know, what are the economics looking like sort of with what we have today before we turn to kind of, um, you know, where things might go? I mean, because um, I appreciate that you need to compete for capital within ExxonMobil. So, I mean, how, how, how do the returns sort of compare and, and do you feel like you're well positioned? Yeah. So, I'd say in terms of on the policy front in general, I'd say sort of good progress, more work to do. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, what, what we've seen over the last couple of years, you know, has has catalyzed a, a, a good amount of activity and exploration. And it's opened up the funnel of projects that have, you know, a prospect of, of working uh, economically. And certainly the, the ones that we've announced and are pursuing, you know, fit exactly in that category I described of they work under today's policy. Mm -hmm. um, you can earn a return under that, uh, under that policy. Um, and you know they work with, as I said, with today's technology, and that's why we're you know we're moving ahead with those. But it is really just the just the beginning. And and if all we did was you know, a handful of projects that that you know, happen to work under this unique set of circumstances, we haven't really solved a lot. Um, you know we need to, as I said, have the policy evolve, have the market continue to evolve, have technology drive the cost of abatement down, because that's what's going to allow us to move out of just these sort of obvious things that work on the Gulf Coast into, you know, things that can work much more scalably in a much broader set of circumstances. Yeah. That I, make, oh, sorry. Well, you know, I was just going to add on, you know, uh, echoing a little bit of what the congressman said earlier, you know, it's one thing to pass the legislation. It's another thing to complete the rulemaking. Right. It's another thing, again, to have the permitting actually work in a way that supports uh, the implementation of these projects. And so we... We need all of those things to occur in order to enable even these initial projects to uh, to happen. And so we're we, along with a lot of other folks here, I imagine, are, are pushing hard to for that to happen. Right, we're all pushing hard. And so, putting the economic piece aside, and you know, sort of this this need for sort of a growing carbon price over time. Uh, what are, can you say a little bit more about the the some of the obstacles that you, you're sort of trying to untangle as, as, as you're bringing these projects forward because that helps shape kind of what maybe other new policies might, might be needed. What, what keeps you up at night as you're thinking about trying to put all the pieces together? Well, I think the, the first thing really is to, to get what's in front of us to work. And, and I, it's really important that, we, that we, we finish this body of work and demonstrate that that works before we sort of rush ahead to the, to the next thing because I think completing that process will give us you know, some clear learnings. And one of the things we've found as a corporation going through these, you know, even these early stage projects is it's it's deceptively simple to describe a point-to-point -point carbon capture project. It's like, well, here's an emitter and here's a storage side and then we're going to have a pipeline that goes from here to there. And you look at that on a piece of paper and you say, well, how complicated can that be? And the answer is really complicated, <laughs> right? And And it's not until you go through the process of actually entering into a full set of definitive agreements between all the parties involved across that, that you sort of force a lot of the issues to the surface that need to be uh, worked through. It's not until you go through all of the permitting for something like that, until you go through the construction, you go through the startup and, and operation. Um, and so I think, you know, while we're looking ahead and figuring out what comes next and, and how do we, you know, create the right in, incentives and, and market momentum for you know, sort of years five to ten, we really need to focus on executing these yeah. things that are in front of us because that in and of itself, I think, will play a really powerful role in in building the momentum we need for the next stage. Building momentum, the financeability, the confidence in the marketplace. Right. right. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I think we could keep talking probably for a, a, for an additional half an hour, but I'm, I'm cognizant of the time and that we have a panel following us. Um, we, we do have a couple of questions from the media that I thought maybe we could, I, I could throw a few out there for you um, and just, just sort of fold that in before we kind of wrap things up. Uh, and I have one here from Carlos Anchando from e, e News who's asking, does ExxonMobil believe that captured carbon dioxide should be used for enhanced oil recovery? And if so, why? Yeah. So enhanced, enhanced oil recovery is something that, that happens today uh, across the industry. Um, 
you know, what we're focused on in, in low carbon solutions is really on the permanent geologic storage side mm -hmm. uh, and, and not on the, not on EOR. Um, EOR has a role to play. It's a different role than, than what we're trying to do. Um, and what we're trying to, to build are very large scale um, carbon storage, permanent carbon storage networks. And that's what's underlying the CF Industries project. It's what's underlying the uh, Lindy project in Port Arthur and it's what's underlying the CCS infrastructure that we're building to support the uh, the hydrogen plant in Baytown. And even you know, with those, let's say just those three projects, it's a big deal. But those, you know, we've now got you know the the foundation of you know CCS infrastructure, you know, really across the entire Gulf Coast there, right. you know, from from Houston all the way across to Louisiana. Uh, and so, you know, that's that's our our starting point, at least from a U.S. perspective, is getting that infrastructure up and running and then building out from that, you know, to, to provide your know, much larger scale, your know, permanent geologic storage. Yeah, thanks. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and f final question from the media. I have one from Alison Prang of Politico, and she's asking, how should companies who are promoting and trying to scale CCUS take environmental justice advocates' concerns into account when they're building these projects? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that, you know, one of the, and it feeds back into this, perspective of we need these initial projects to work. And when we say we need them to work, we need them to also work for the communities that, you know, the projects are, are happening in. And so, you know, all along the Gulf Coast, we have these huge sources of emissions. And so, obviously, addressing those emissions in the, com in the communities is, is a great starting point. But we, we need to go further than that. We need to also make sure that we're, you know, addressing, and this came up in the congressman's comments as well, you know, concerns of, of, of folks in those areas, explaining what it is, you know, that we're doing, you know, why does this benefit uh, their communities, you know, how does this help, you know, the, you know, the person in the street, you know, that, that might be concerned about this. And so to give a couple examples in the, in this, in the project in Louisiana, um, we're very engaged with the local communities, you know, all the way sort of along the, the, uh, the span of that project uh, uh, across that part of the state. Um, you know, we've been engaged, for example, with, you know, the first responders, you know, that, you know, if they have to respond to a situation and having our safety folks engaged with them and, and helping, you know, helping them uh, develop an understanding of what we're doing. Uh, we've been engaged with, uh, uh, with Ducks Unlimited, an organization where we're, you know, helping restore 900 acres of, of marshland, um, you know, that the community's uh, being focused on there. And so it's having these, you know, direct community engagement, both in terms of, explaining what we're doing, how it benefits them, how it benefits society more generally, but really focused on the, the very, you know, direct impact to the community. Uh, obviously, you know, there's jobs and employment that come with these projects, right. uh, and that's a big opportunity as well. Right. Great. Thanks. Well, I think we're just about at the time to wrap up, you know, um, so maybe one, one final question for you. Is, and it's, it's, it's no secret to, to, to those who have heard me speak on energy and, and climate issues, and if you follow the work of the BPC, we really have the view that um, the oil and gas industry in general has the skill set, the expertise, the technical acumen, and the capital to really be part of the energy transi transition. And so um, when, when we think about kind of the industrial scale decarbonization that you're talking about here, it gets me really excited uh, because I think that's just what we need right now at the moment we're in to really start to bend the curve on emissions. And so this has been terrific. And I'd just love to ask you maybe as a final thought, what gets you most excited about the work you're doing? Well, it goes back to sort of the, my journey here, which I've always enjoyed working on these huge intractable problems. And I think this is, this is the biggest one. And I think the, you know, ExxonMobil can play a, a huge role in, in actually like measurably bending the curve of the world's path to net zero. And that is the, the scale of the ambition that we, that we have here. And we're starting quote unquote small, you know, the corporations committed 17 billion dollars of sort of seed capital to, you know, to get the effort going. <laughs> just, just a little. Uh, just a little uh, over the next uh, over the next five years, but I think that demonstrates the the scale of the uh, of the initial commitment and seriousness. But that's really just the beginning of of the opportunity uh, that we think we have to bring the skill set of ExxonMobil to you know, exactly as you described to you know very large scale problem and start to make some very large scale progress toward that. Uh, it took decades to get into this situation. It's going to take decades to get out of it, but we need to get started and get moving, and that's what we're doing. That's great. Well, 
Thanks. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Great. But thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. You can go this way. Appreciate that. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Dan Fishman, who will lead the next panel. Thanks, Dan. All right, panelists, come on, come on up. I see. Yeah. All right. Well, great so far. Man, Congressman Graves had a lot to say. Um, we talked about permitting, talked about community engagement, talked about policy. Um, Dan really talked about the business model. Uh, now we've got here an expert panel um, representing uh, a coalition, representing state government, representing the private sector, uh, and we're going to try to get a little deeper. That's the goal here. So uh, first off, we've got uh, Brett Logue. He's a CEO at Elysian. 25 years of experience in energy and technology, working on all aspects of project development, legal, financial, and operations, including over a decade working on carbon capture and storage projects. He served for 10 years as an investment banker at Grandview Capital, and prior to that as an attorney, uh, focused on energy and project finance. Uh, got a bachelor's in JD from Stanford. Jesse Stolark on the end, executive director of the Carbon Capture Coalition. She's been with the coalition since 2019. Um, before that, she uh, managed uh, carbon capture and industrial decarb portfolio at Third Way. Uh, she's got a master's degree in applied geosciences from the University of Pennsylvania and a bachelor's from Bryn Mawr College. In the middle, Jason Lanclos, <laughs> director of the State Energy Office at the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources. Uh, he's been with uh, the LDNR since 2018. Uh, prior to that, he worked on Coastal Production and Restoration Authority in the Governor's Office. Uh, with 13 years of private sector experience uh, before that. Uh, he's on the executive board of the uh, National Association of State Energy Officials and holds a degree in civil and environmental engineering from Louisiana State University. So, Jesse, let's start with you. Okay. You are the executive director for the Carbon Capture Coalition. What is the Carbon Co Capture Coalition? Who is in it? What, what, what is this thing? Sure. Thanks, Dan, and thanks to the Bipartisan Policy Center for having having us here today. So the Carbon Capture Coalition is a nonpartisan partisan collaboration of more than 100 uh, organizations all working in common cause to enable economy-wide deployment. And so our membership is incredibly diverse, both uh, sectorally diverse as well as politically diverse, and it includes industry, nonprofit, and labor organizations. And so uh, that really makes the coalition unique. We are kind of, I think, a unique, bring a unique perspective to the energy and climate discussion here in Washington, D.C. And then the other thing that makes the coalition really unique is that we work on a consensus basis. So all of the positions and work that we do um, as a coalition is informed by the consensus positions of our membership. Terrific. Uh, Jason, you're here from the, from the state perspective, Louisiana. And, you know, you're, you're, part of the Association of Energy Officials, you've got experience with carbon capture and storage. How are you thinking at a state level of your general decarbonization pathway, your energy goals? How does this all fit in uh, with your state goals? Sure. Uh, great question. So uh, I, I had the pleasure of going to a carbon capture coalition meeting in 2018, met Jesse and the team. and. I had worked on uh, some on the coastal side, worked on something called the verifiable carbon standard, with more on the ecological side, something that Congressman Graves, who was uh, a part of that agency many years ago, referenced. And so introduction to carbon there and really what, what Jesse just described was was really what I saw, you know, a large group of individuals working on decarbonization. We took a lot of those tools and lessons from that coalition and brought them back to Louisiana. Uh, really, and met with the governor and started uh, what, what we are very proud of, which is a climate plan in Louisiana. To go the first Gulf Coast state, I think, that has done a climate plan that brought a very, very degrees, diverse group of stakeholders together. Had a, a lot of conversations about how we look at Louisiana. Louisiana is a very complicated state in very many ways. Our emission profile, specifically, we're a very, very uh, difficult to decarbonize state. So a lot of industry, a lot of manufacturing. We, we ship products all over the world. 
So we have a very mixed CO2 stream and a very, you know, average 2 million metric tons of CO2 per year, so or 200. So um, we have working very, very strategically to look at, you know, commercially viable solutions. And what, what we very quickly realized and, and what I think our policies realized is that it's not a one size fits all, right? It's going to take a very comprehensive approach to, to make these things work. CCUS has been one of the most, um, what I would call prolific solutions that we've seen unprecedented response. Um, and, and what I, you know, 2018, there were very few companies who were looking at it just because the costs were, were just astronomical. And, and, and I really, to see what has happened over the last four or five years in terms of incentives, in terms of folks and groups working together, like the BPC and others, to support, you know, enhancing 45Q it's brought companies to the table that we weren't talking to four years ago. So that's extremely exciting. Um, we, we think that we're on the front lines of, of climate change. You know, Louisiana chain, I could talk about that for hours. You know, we, we, we're changing dramatically. We have a coastal state that's lost a, a state the size of Delaware in terms of land loss, you know. So these are things that are very, very front and center in folks' minds. Community benefits in terms of looking at how the state starts to transition. It's, it's an inflection point now that we really have to get right. So we want to do things that we, we set the right policies so that solutions that are, we're working on really are going to be available and really be something that are impactful and are around for a long period of time. So that's a, a really brief introduction in terms of what we do at the Department of Natural Resources. But the climate plan is something that we're extremely proud of. And I think that you know, as we're, we're starting to work towards solutions and implement those things, that's where we're, we're going to make progress. Terrific. You mentioned community benefits there, and, and Congressman Graves also uh, focused on that a little bit too. We're going to we're going to come back to that. Um, but one of the things you said is that you're trying to set the table for businesses to come in and invest. Brett, you are the CEO at Elysian. Could you just give us a, a flavor for what is what is your business model, and you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law passed, the Inflation Reduction Act passed. How do you see the business opportunity? What's the business environment right now for in the, the carbon capture and storage space? Sure. And uh, thanks uh, again to the bipartisan policy for uh, in inviting us here. Um, so Elysian is a uh, dedicated end-to-end uh, -end CCS developer. Dedicated meaning all we do is work on CCS. End-to-end, -end, we cover capture, transport, and storage. And developer means we're primarily interested in building projects, um, and and that means you know putting steel in the ground and, and getting from you know sort of history of, of talking about this to, to actually uh, building things. Um, as you mentioned, I've been uh, involved in the CCS space for now almost 15 years, um, and uh, it's you know been you know it's sort of have some of the scars to to show for that. Um, but it you know this is a very exciting time. Uh, to be a developer or to be focused on projects in part because of these you know recent um, uh, uh, legislative uh, improvements um, so one of the we found that Elysian in 2019 uh, kind of on the back of the last round of changes to 45 Q um, and we were focused at that point on some you know higher concentration sources you know, ethanol um, ammonia fertilizer type uh, plants but with you know the modifications from the bipartisan um, uh, uh, the BIF, the Bipartisan Infrastructure um, uh, Bill, and then also with um, the IRA, you know, we've really begun to you know, turn our attention you know, to some of the uh, lower concentration um, sources. And, and we, you know, we have uh, completed a feed on post-combustion capture on a natural gas combined cycle uh, plant. Uh, we've also um, filed and gotten administratively complete on our first uh, Class 6 application. And, and so we've been, you know, trying to move forward um, projects to, to ultimately um, get, you know, captured done at scale. Terrific. Jesse, you mentioned uh, being a consensus-based organization. Um, I know that you guys have a, a policy blueprint in the works. Uh, any chance you could kind of give us a preview of, of what that is and, you know, how you went about getting to the, the point where you had a, a policy blueprint? Sure, yeah. So we will, I'm happy to say, we will be releasing our 2023 policy blueprint next Monday. You're all invited to the, the virtual launch event. Um, and really the policy blueprint for the coalition, this is our third iteration of the policy blueprint, sets the priorities and, as you said earlier, kind of table setting for the coalition and its memberships for engagement uh, over the course of the Congress. And so, 
You know, this, this year and in this Congress, we really had the enviable position of all of our legislative accomplishments um, you know, happening in the last Congress through primarily Bill and Ira. And so, you know, looking almost at like a blank slate with, with these two historic policies in place, we now have the framework that's necessary to deploy projects, um, you know, necessary at the scale and pace needed for not only the 2030 goals, but the 2050 goals. So, you know, looking forward, it, the scope is much broader and it's really on not only enacting additional policies, but uh, implementing the, the policy framework that's in place. And then just to give you a little preview of some of the, the near-term priorities that are outlined in that um, document, you know, we think there's a tremendous opportunity to store CO2 on federal lands. Um, there's uh, a lot of opportunity there, but there's not a lot of clarity in how you do that. Um, additionally, and I think we might talk about it a little later, but you know, are there still kind of some remaining tweaks that are needed to 45Q after um, what happened in the Inflation Reduction Act? Um, and then, you know, looking longer term, it's, it's looking at things like market development. What are the pieces that are, are going to be really required to ensure that um, the marketplace is available for, you know, purchasing these, the products and services that carbon management provide, can provide? You mentioned my friends Bill and Ira, <laughs> and um, you know, as, as good friends as they've been <laughs> to me personally and the entire carbon capture community, um, I, I do think that there are still some, uh, some challenges in the community, um, particularly uh, one of them I think is, is permitting. We've, we've uh, talked about it several times. Um, you know, Congressman Graves talked about his, his leadership in the House with the Builder Act. Um, We've talked a little bit about Classics Wells. Um, we've got the permitting challenges for building projects, for pipelines, for wells, the, uh, the entire uh, value chain of CCUS. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go to both Brett and Jason on this. Um, could, could you talk a little bit about what, what is the, the challenge right now with the current permitting regime as you're thinking about investing? Uh, and, and what do you think are the, the, the biggest near-term uh, solutions uh, to help speed the process in an efficient way that's also safe. Do you want to start? Sure. Um, I, I think looking back, we, in 2018, as I referenced, we, we, we were looking at opportunities in terms of, you know, starting to put the pieces together for a climate plan, you know, introduction into CCUS, looking at how we could bring in companies to, to Louisiana. Um, so, Part of that was looking at what had been done before, right? So six, six potential permits. You look at the four demonstration permits, the uh, two others that were done at ADM, and then you know the six-year time frame. That, that was something that was very front and center for us to say that we, we absolutely needed to look for ways as a state to say either develop the expertise, to train our staff, and looking at permitting, we knew that that would be something that we could do in, internally, that if, we, if we, we, we've got these great groups of scientists that we have in our Office of Conservation, they, they understand the geology, they understand how to, to look at long-term modeling. And I think that you know, over time what we've seen is that we've put a lot of resources into developing this, the staff. We've added additional resources to try to get ready for what we all knew was going to be an influx of projects coming into Louisiana. We've talked about major developments, CF Industries, Air Products. We, ha we have uh, grown fuels. We have the sustainable biofuels facility in North Louisiana. I, I am very um, thankful that I think that we, we are putting those resources in the right place because I think at the end of the day, one of the things that we continue to hear was that you know uncertainty drives business away. So we, we want to make sure that we have a very, very clear footprint and path forward. So if someone wants to invest, our Louisiana economic development folks become very well engaged, our Department of our Natural Resources folks understand the permitting. And I think that gives companies, it takes some of the certainty out. It's not flawless. Believe me, there's still challenges there. But I think that having you know, 38, 37 folks in, in our group who understand that carbon management is a major priority for what we're trying to do as a state. We have plans that have elevated these things where they're excited and have come out of school and we've been able to hire people you know, in a very, very challenging environment where they're getting paid more in the private sector, but they're coming to DNR because they want to work on carbon management. So that's, that's exciting and it's really, really, I, I guess, uh, memorialized our plans and saying that you know, focusing on permitting is going to be very important. So I think that for us, that's been a big challenge is to, to recruit the right folks, but also to make that a priority. So the other things that we'll talk about later, I'm sure, are you know, just, just really going out, and Congressman Gray's referenced that, you know, ensuring that the public has a very clear understanding that you know, 
our state cannot, we, we can educate and inform. We can't go out and say, hey, this is the right thing to do because of this. But, you know, industry has a role, the state and government have a role, and then there, have to, there has to be another backstop for folks to be able to go and get information to say that, you know, folks like the Bipartisan Policy Center and others in universities, that's where communities and others need to say, okay, here, here's the big picture. This is how all this stuff works together. This is what carbon capture is. This is what it's not. And I think that that will help to, to really to cultivate that conversation. So, thanks, Sam. I'm really glad to hear you say that. One of the things we've been we have been working on here at the, at the Bipartisan Policy Center is is thinking through what does public engagement look like, and is there a way to do it where all of the onus is not on the project developer, um, but instead on some other trusted entity that can be a resource uh, to the community uh, with just factual information about technologies like CCUS that are, you know, separate than specific projects just to have a, a conversation that's, that's not about a project but about a technology, lay the facts on the ground, um, see what the concerns are, and be able to address them. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about, about public engagement um, while, while we're on it. You know, I, I think um, uh, Congressman Graves talked about this also, and I think maybe, maybe Dan too, but, you know, there's, there's an element of not just of, uh, you know, addressing public concerns, but also providing benefit to the local community. Um, does anyone want to just talk a little bit about what you see as, as the value add to communities for having CCUS projects uh, in their state, local community? Well, I mean, I think there are both, you know, local, regional, and global benefits to these projects. I mean, I think that's one of the attractive parts about it. So I, and I think that's part of, you know, the pitch um, to the communities as as well, uh, because I I do think that you know there are concerns um, for for various reasons you know uh, some having to do with you know historical incidents of, uh, around you know transport um, there's a lot of uncertainty around storage you know the the idea of capture is is somewhat new and and so you, know, you and and I think a lot of the communities where the emitters are based have his, historically been disadvantaged and the location of those projects has partially been due to the fact that they were economically disadvantaged and it was advantageous to put those you know resources there but these projects you know they're going to you know clean up um, emissions you know related to some of those existing facilities um, they're going to develop you know local um, jobs that will be sort of beneficial to um, the local communities because there are you know both construction jobs as well as long term um, uh, employment associated with operating um, the the capture transport and and storage um, facilities and then there's really the the global impact of having carbon reduction you know associated with these projects with oftentimes it's it's a global benefit with local um, impacts as well in terms of the kind of mitigation you know that might be otherwise necessary for climate impacts that you know we are now addressing by you know doing these capture projects Thanks, Jason. Um, you know, you you um, you mentioned before about um, when we were talking about air quality associated with having a carbon capture project uh, added onto an existing industrial facility. Could you could you get a little bit deeper on the on the air quality sure. issue? Sure. Sure. Uh, and 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 maybe uh, I'll, I'll focus just a little bit more and 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 go a little bit further with those comments. I, I think that for for us as a state, you know, we, we with a complicated emission profile that I mentioned earlier, a fifth of the nation's refining capacity. We have seen, and, and when I worked in private practice, one of the things that, that, that I remember very vividly is, you know, so a lot of the times when we go into communities and do environmental assessments, you know, you, you had a may, major, maybe a paper mill or another major source of revenue that had been there for 40 or 50 years. When that mill closes, the, the devastation to the town and to the surrounding community is, is, is very dramatic. And seeing that and, and seeing the role that industry plays, seeing the role that the state plays, seeing what we've, we're facing with climate change and seeing that communities need to be put front and center, all those things I think come together with a lot of these solutions. And, and with carbon capture, what was always so compelling when we looked at this as a solution is part of it, part of the overall solution of installing carbon capture equipment, even amine-based equipment. Obviously there are advances that are capturing 98, 99% of carbon dioxide. You are removing priority pollutants from the air. So in, in the communities that we have heavy industry, in the communities where we have advanced manufacturing, 
this can be done and actually improve air quality. And I think that that's a, a win at the end of the day that, you know, that you're doing an improvement to air quality in those communities. The other thing is, is that you're protect, protecting the financial impacts of what you have for the schools and businesses and those surrounding communities. And, and so jobs is another major factor to this in terms of being able to have an educational component for kids who want to major and go into these fields to say, how do we go into advanced manufacturing? How do I go into hydrogen? How, what, what do I have to major in to major in carbon management? And the thing that's so exciting is that some of our local universities, and I'll use LSU as an example, and that's not a bias, but it, they, they, were very, they were very proactive in terms of saying that, hey, look, carbon management's gonna be a big deal. So what can we do? And I remember having a conversation a couple of years ago, and now their petroleum engineering program actually has a carbon management and carbon capture focus area where a student can go in and really start to get coursework so that when they graduate, they have advanced tools to go into you know, a company like Elysian or a company that's doing some of these advanced modeling things or geological sequestration and hit the ground running. And I think that that's, you know, that's where we need to look at this holistically to say that these challenges aren't going to go away. You know? And I think that there are states, and I, and I work with a lot of other states through NASIO and a lot of other organizations through GPI and others, you know, every state's different. You know, I think we need to remember that, that you, know, you have states that have a very straightforward path forward for renewables or have resources that make those, those, those issues very straightforward. You know, we do a lot of work with Oklahoma. They have 52% of their power that's produced by renewables. That's, that's phenomenal. Louisiana cannot get there as soon as they did. We don't have the wind resource. We don't have all these others. So every solution that we're trying to move forward, whether it's looking at methane monitoring on our orphan wells or, or how we're looking at you know, long-term profiles and incorporating hydrogen into our industrial applications, all those things can work together, I think, to really help communities to get better. And I think that at the end of the day, that educational component, you know, we hear, we, we saw this on solar where you know, a local police jury association or a local council they, they were desperate for answers in, in terms of, you know, wh what do we do? How, you know, is there a model ordinance? How, how do we face this new industry with solar? And so, we, you know, luckily we partnered with the planning organization and they developed a model ordinance with a lot of input where a smaller, let's say a smaller parish or community can, can use that ordinance to say, here's a go-by of what we can do. The same needs to be done, I think, for CCUS because there's, we talk to folks all the time and there's so many differing opinions about what it is and what it isn't the safety mechanisms, and I think at the end of the day, having a body of work which we're starting to develop, which is investing in projects and moving some of these things forward so that folks can see that, hey, these things do work. Here are the metrics. We're actually carbon, capturing carbon dioxide. Air quality is starting to improve. That's what we all want at the end of the day, is that for the, you know, we, we have one of the most rigorous class six programs that has, I think EPA has ever done. We have class well primacy for class wells one through five right now in Louisiana. Class six we've been working on, and I know there was a question earlier. We filed our primacy application, and we have, we're very confident that that's moving forward. You know, EPA has a lot in front of them in order to, to get these permits out of the door, but you know, we want it to be proactive. So get, again, focusing on making sure that we're doing these things the right way and, and seeing the level of detail that's required with these projects and with these permits. And I think that that's what the, really the public needs to see is that they, you know, they, these aren't things that are just being done to rush through it. These things that are going to be done the right way, that companies are going to capture carbon, that it's going to be transported safely, and it's going to be secured geologically, say, you know, stored permanently the right way. Those are things that the public needs to see. And again, it can't just be industry telling them. It can't just be the state telling them. There has to be, uh, I guess, a, a really a, a group that's working together to inform them to say that, hey, the, the, these are the right solutions and this is why. Terrific. In, in a second, I'm going to go to, to Brett to talk a little bit more about Class 6 wells. Uh, then I'm going to go to Jesse to talk about 45Q. And then I'm going to come into audience questions. I know we're coming tight on time. Um, that's, that's the order, just a preview. <laughs> And if you wanted to add on to that before you talk about Class I, I, I only, I just, I just wanted to sort of emphasize something and th just that, that I think is sometimes overlooked about CCS, which is that CCS preserves existing infrastructure and, and assets. I mean, like, so at Donaldsonville, there's an existing massive fertilizer plant, and Exxon is coming in and helping to facilitate adding an additional facility plus the pipeline plus the storage and that facility will stay there. It, it doesn't need to be displaced. It's going to be enhanced. And that's one of the things that CCS allows. Terrific. You know, I know, I know you, you, you're making investment decisions um, based partially on, on where the storage opportunities are. 
And part of that is, is you know, can you get a permit? You like, how, you know, when you're when you're thinking about where you site your your locations, how do you how do you think through that permitting challenge? Uh, are there you know multiple paths that you can take? It's a good it's a good question. So I mean, as a independent project developer, you know, we're primarily focused on doing things on a project finance basis, which means you know, project finance means the projects need to sort of exist on their own legs, which means that we have to eliminate all the uncertainty. And right now, you know, a lot of the uncertainty has been sort of squeezed out of the system in the la through, you know, Bill and Ira, um, your buddies. Uh, but one of the things that it really hasn't has been class six, um, which is, you know, we have a, a, our, you know, class six application in. We've gotten through to the administratively complete phase. Um, so we've gotten that far. But now we are looking forward with, you know, not clear, you know, when that permit, you know, to construct will be issued, and then whether or not we'll get a permit to inject you know, after we've constructed it. And so one of the things, and it was mentioned in, in, in the talk with uh, Dan, is, is that there is enhanced oil recovery. And you know, when we first initiated our, our project three years ago, you know, we looked at enhanced oil recovery as the most likely outlet for the CO2 as basically a bridge to you know, doing saline injection, in part because it's done now, it's been done for 40 years, and getting a class two uh, permit is a relatively straightforward process. I think, you know, something on the order of like, you know, 43 states, you know, have primacy, you know, for, for class two um, uh, permits. So it's much more straightforward. So, so what, what does that mean? How, how long would it take to get a class two permit to do EOR? A couple of months. A couple of months. And how long to get a class six permit? Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, EPA not. says they want to be done in two years. They say they want to be done in two years. Okay. Um, great. We're, we're getting tight on time. 45Q, Jesse, why is it amazing and how can it be more amazing? <laughs> so in 45Q, of course, we had the restructuring of 45Q in the 2018 Future Act, which really expanded the eligibility of the program to direct our capture to heavy industry. And then, of course, we had what happened in IRA, um, which increased the credit values. It also provided the direct pay provisions as well as transferability. Um, it lowered the, the thresholds that you need to, to be able to claim the credit. And so what we tell people is like on 45Q, the cake is largely baked, right? So now we're looking forward to working with Treasury and IRS to make sure that they promulgate final regulations for 45Q. But project developers, you know, can still move forward with the existing regulations. Um, and then looking forward on 45Q, you know, and I kind of teed up earlier, just, you know, there are additional things that didn't happen in IRA that we'd like to see. The first is that, unfortunately, uh, the credit does not adjust for inflation until 2026. And so we're already seeing a real erosion in the credit values today because of persistent inflation in, throughout the economy. Uh, the second is we would like to see um, parity between the carbon reuse credit level and uh, saline sequestration. You know, uh, carbon reuse for products and useful things like concrete or fuels or chemicals um, you know, they don't have the market, the established markets like enhanced oil recovery do. And, and so currently the, the CO2 reuse credit level is paired with the enhanced oil recovery. So there's actually a bill in Congress, the CCU Parity Act, that's been introduced on a bicameral, bipartisan basis, and, and we support that. And then, you know, I think we are so thrilled that we got direct pay. We got it for five years. That might cause some problems down the line. You know, if the payment window is 12 years, and then if you only have your direct pay for five years, what's kind of how do you finance the credit on the back end? And so that's something we're also kind of considering and actively thinking about. So the work's still not done, but I think we're a long way there. I have so many more questions, <laughs> uh, but I'm going to try to be somewhat polite and see if any, any, anyone in the audience would like to ask a question. But if not, I have more. Don't worry. <laughs> and if, if anyone online has YouTube chat comments, let me know. Hi, Aaron Blary with the Global CCS Institute. So I'm familiar with the narrative about um, decarbonizing existing assets. That's really fantastic, a great part of CCS. But I think one of the underrated narratives is um, once you have the CCS infrastructure in place, then it's greenfield development, and you can bring in new development and decarbonize that. So um, my question to all the panelists, Brett, is that part of your business case? Are you pitching to bring in new uh, companies into, you know, once you develop a storage site, uh, Jason, when uh, the you know, state of Louisiana, are they advertising this as part of um, your mission forward? And Jesse, 
Um, what kind of policy barriers are there that may need to get out of the way to make this a larger part of the message? Triple question. Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I think certainly, you know, our first focus is, is finding that anchor tenant for the storage hub and connecting those things. So connecting an existing emitter and, and, and the storage slates. And then we also look around and say, well, what other emitters are in the neighborhood that can be linked up to lower the sort of cost of transport and, and storage? But certainly, you know, other, you know, potential industries coming there now because the barriers to, you know, transport and storage have, have effectively been eliminated. And if you're in places like Louisiana, I mean, endless storage yep. um, capability and, and capacity. And so therefore, you know, that's an opportunity for lots more industry to come in that starts zero, net, you know, net zero rather than needs to, be, to, to go there. Aaron, great question. Uh, I, I, I could spend a while answering it, but I, I think that was a lot of the premise of how we put together our hydrogen hub, which was to bring hydrogen into facilities. We have this great industrial corridor that spreads across Louisiana, a lot of big facilities with a lot of emissions that are close in terms of proximity. So being able to leverage infrastructure to where hydrogen goes into facilities, carbon dioxide goes out, you know, looking at offshore developments, making sure that we have the right pathway to start looking in the Gulf of Mexico that has this unprecedented amount of storage space as well. So I, I think that folks are starting, we're, we're, in, in my humble opinion, we're going to see the poor space that is available, that is quick to develop, go first. And then you're going to start to see a lot of these relationships start to build where companies start to work together to say, okay, we can, we can put these two together. We can invest in infrastructure. So we have those conversations, but I think we have to get some of the easier projects done first out of the gate. That's and I would just add quickly, you know, I think the vision and that's sort of the way that the administration has certainly moved the ball forward is, is, in, this, is in this hub's vision where kind of we have this shared infrastructure, but then there is reality, right? And it's really challenging to do one project, much, le much less kind of a hub where you have a lot of projects together. And so I think it gets back to kind of the earlier conversation around permitting and other steps that we can take at the federal level to ensure that, you know, project developers feel confident to move forward and, and, and move from those those low risk projects, you know, those low hanging fruit projects to ones that are going to be much more complicated. All right. Even though we're over time, I'm going <laughs> to extend it just a little bit. We've got an online question that I'm, two online questions that I'm going to combine, both, both from reporters. Um, one's from uh, Carlos Sanchado with e, e News, another from Allison Prong with Politico. Uh, I'm going to kind of combine them. What's holding up Louisiana's Class 6 primacy? And um, if other states' uh, applications take as long as it does for Louisiana, what are the consequences of that? So I think this one's probably for Jason. Sure. So um, I won't get into details, but we, look, we, we've been working on our Class 6 uh, program with EPA. The, the regional folks have been fantastic. I think that, you know, we, we've got... It's been challenging in terms of the time frame. What I will say is that we're getting very close and we feel very confident that we're getting toward the finish line. So I think that, you know, that's what's exciting. We, we, we knew that, you know, that there would be a lot of information that we had to put together. But, um, you know, the thing that we're focused on now is that we are very close to the finish line and we want to, to try to, to make sure that, again, the public understands that there are a lot of different things associated with this, but we also want to set the standards so that when other states are looking at this, that they can use, you know, the liability laws that we've put together on poor space and also, you know, a lot of the stuff we've done in the application to hopefully get through, you know, EPA's review process a little bit more quickly. So again, you know, each, each state's a little bit different, but we think that we had a lot of the complicated features associated with our application. So hopefully there'll be a, a good go by a, after this. Thank you. You know, I, I would love to keep this conversation going. You guys are so terrific. There's more to ask, but as someone who believes in permitting reform, I do, I do believe in timelines. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, please give everyone a round of applause. <laughs> and we have a reception right uh, this way. Please stick around.